Hello and welcome to Moderate Fantasy Violence, a podcast about pop culture and the world around it. I am Mick. And I'm Alistair. And this is episode 13, which on a fortnightly schedule means we've been doing this for a whole six months now. It's pretty good, still going. Mm. It's our half of anniversary, half of definitely being a word. And to entirely coincidentally celebrate this occasion, we've got our first ever guest coming on. Our first segment will be Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, the new play continuation of the classic fantasy series. And we've got guest booktuber and massive Potter fan Claire Vuso coming on to talk about that. I know spoilers on this are a bit of a hot topic, although the book is now out, so I think they're probably going to be spreading around a bit. But yeah, basically there are a few minutes at the very beginning of the segment where we do give our broad spoiler-free opinions, and then there'll be a clear spoiler warning and a noise, and then if you want to avoid spoilers, you'll need to either stop the podcast or use the timestamps in the blog post to jump forward to our next segment, which is Star Trek Beyond. And then we will be talking about my recommendation from last time, which is the video game folk music of Rebecca Mays. <sighs> right, that was a lot of info. And just for the record, guys, one take, one fucking take. So to give me a break, Alistair, what have you been doing, seeing or listening to? In the last week, I've been watching Sharknado, or more accurately, Sharknado 3. Oh, hell no. <laughs> it's just... fair, a fair response, I feel. It's pretty funny. A lot of people right now are aware of the Sharknado franchise. It's uh, pretty self-explanatory. There's a tornado made out of sharks that randomly attacks people. They seem to make each film increasingly over the top and ridiculous. It's a very serious meteorological thriller. In this one, they've introduced like David Hasselhoff. You know, no movie franchise is complete without David Hasselhoff. And them travelling into space to uh, to fight sharks for reasons passing explanation. To give away too many of the ridiculous reveals would be, I feel, to spoil the film. But yes, there's some stupid bullshit in there. It's not really a film in which plot is kind of the appeal of the film. The whole thing's done with tongue firmly in cheek. They're pretty funny. I think the Sharknado team have recognised that the one thing they need to be is not boring. It's like, as long as they keep people entertained by just throwing anything at the screen then they've done their job as long as people don't just start tuning out and going oh whatever more sharks yeah the production values might be low the story might be ridiculous but it's reliably eventful and the comic timing is usually there they've really mastered the single joke of a man is walking across the frame and then he's swept out of it by a flying shark yeah they definitely got that comic beat right down yeah which is pretty much most of the appeal of the film it's just seeing that over and over yeah yeah it's somehow they find just enough variations on it, but it just never quite stops being funny. Yeah, cool. So what have you been up to this last week, Nick? Well, like, I think a lot of people in the Nerdosphere the weekend before last, I watched a load of trailers coming out of San Diego Comic Convention, including long-awaited trailers for the, the future DC superhero franchise films, like Wonder Woman and Justice League, plus the Marvel Doctor Strange trailer, and also Marvel TV's Luke Cage trailer, and also Marvel TV's Legion trailer, and trailers, trailers, trailers. There's also one for that Fantastic Beasts film spinning out of Harry Potter. Did you have a favourite trailer? Uh, Did I have a favourite trailer? I... Because I do seem to be moving towards dramatically preferring superhero TV to superhero films, I do come away probably most interested in Luke Cage and Legion. Of the films... It sounds like Marvel had some good footage that they just didn't put on the internet. So, like, there was apparently the um, director of 4-3 made a sort of comedy mockumentary sketch with Chris Hemsworth about what 4 had been doing during Civil War, which sounds great, but I don't know if it's ever going to appear on the internet if I'll just have to wait and buy the, the 4 Ragnarok DVD or something. Yeah, I mean, I'll get to see that. I really liked the Luke Cage trailer. I thought that looked really looks really good. I mean, partly because we know the Luke Cage character from the jessica jones tv show and you know you know he was good in that that gives me confidence that the show will be good but the trailer was very entertaining had a lot of pizzazz well yeah when they're churning out superhero thing after superhero thing the main thing you want for these trailers is reassurance that this one has you know some kind of fresh take or fresh style or will be at least something in some way different from the general mass and yeah luke cage did very much stand out was wonder woman and Justice League looked okay. The Justice League trailer seemed very keen to tell us they'd discovered humour. It was a strange one because it wasn't quite a trailer. It was more of like a few scenes that they had, or a few like short clips that they had ready from the films. Sizzle reel? Is that what they call it in the biz? I don't uh, know. I'm not sure. There was lots of Batman bantering, which seemed borderline out of character, considering how alien he was to the concept of banter in Batman v Superman. I think, they, yeah, I think you're right. They've discovered that a little bit of humour will make the whole thing a bit more enjoyable. Rather than being just so dour and grim. I mean, it was still a bit muted palettes, blocky figures. Ben Affleck does sort of, I'm a likeable guy quite well, so I can't really blame them for maybe giving him the chance to do a likeable Batman. But there seemed to be some scenes where Bruce Wayne had a beard. Surely that's going to fuck up his secret identity quite a lot. It would make it more obvious. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I thought being clean shaven was basically the one thing he has to do to operate as Batman. That and, like, exercise. Yeah. There's a Wonder Woman trailer. I thought it was interesting that it was. It's a period piece. It's set during the First World War. I want that sweet, sweet Captain America money. I mean, that was something interesting. Although, I don't know, the trailer 
did look like it had a lot of empty spectacle in it. It does seem to be like another you know, Superman-esque, invulnerable superhero who just kind of storms around killing everyone. It doesn't seem like it's going to have a lot of tension. There's also some horrendously clunky writing in that trailer. I'm re- really not sure how we're supposed to take all this stuff about her being like a Greek god or whatever, seriously. I think it probably depends how they present it, which obviously hasn't sold you so far, but we'll see how it looks in the the finished film. I I don't know, there wasn't any plot in the trailer, really. I couldn't tell you for sure what the film's about, other than Wonder Woman in the past. I think there was a lot of... The key message that I took away from that trailer was Wonder Woman is awesome. I know I was mostly sold on it, to be honest, just because it's an interesting new take, but I know you're less a fan of the big, iconic, invulnerable superheroes. I don't know, it it just... There was just something that seemed really great on me in that trailer. I know it just it just looked like another kind of just sort of empty explosions and special effects, and you know I didn't get a sense of like like the character or the or the drama at the core of the story. It, it it just struck me as yeah quite empty and quite dull. Probably same as Batman versus Superman. <laughs> yeah, I mean obviously the, the the big appeal is at this time the massive invulnerable superhero is a woman rather than a man, which is it, makes it more interesting than the average. He's sort of your invulnerable man superhero. That is, like, obviously... So as somebody who doesn't not... like invulnerable superheroes, that still isn't going to entirely float the boat for you. It does seem a bit ridiculous that, you know, we started making superhero films in, like, 1999, and it's, you know, nearly 10 years later, and only just getting around to doing one with a, a female lead. That is, is 20 years later, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, 20, yeah, sorry, 20 years later, yeah. I lost track of time there. But yeah, it, it just, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's quite ridiculous, yeah. Yeah, well, we'll have to wait and see. And obviously, lo- there are lots of good films that have bad trailers. We're talking about one of them later, aren't we? Yeah, no, exactly. Our main event this episode is the discussion of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, currently showing at the Palace Theatre in London. For this segment, we'll be joined by a special guest, booktuber and writer Claire Rousseau. Hello. Hello. Hello, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Nick and Claire have seen Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, which takes place 19 years after the end of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows and follows the adventures of Harry and Ginny Weasley's son, Albus, when he's at Hogwarts. Claire, you're new to the show, so I'm going to start by asking you what you thought of the play. I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it was quite easy to um, get swept up in it. I'm a very long-time Harry Potter fan, so it felt comfortable and warm and a bit over the top. There was a bit too much exposition, and it was quite focused on a few characters so that it felt a bit sad to realise that some of your favourite characters got missed out. But overall, I just really enjoyed the general experience of it of like new harry potter material yeah i mean i think ultimately it's a sort of great big fun expensive night out for the big harry potter fans so you're going to give them what they want and let them you know immerse themselves in the warm bath of harry potter so to say this there are bits of this which were a bit fan wank is probably a bit of a stupid non-criticism yes it was it, it was good i liked it i i'm not as big a fan as claire i don't think but i really liked the, the harry potter books back when i read them which was ages ago as i didn't have time to do a reread and yeah it gave me all the good nostalgic feels i liked it quite a bit okay those in case you didn't notice were spoiler free opinions and we're now going to spoil the shit out of it in the way that we usually do everything so there are some people who haven't seen it yet or haven't bought the book that should be out by the time we release this so if you're avoiding the spoilers if you want to hashtag keep the secrets then i'm gonna play a noise in about whenever i finish talking seconds and then we will proceed to spoil the shit out of the rest of the play so this is your last chance either turn us off or the timestamps are in the blog post if you want to jump to our next bit okay so last warning and Yeah, I would like to actually disagree with Nick a little bit about it being only for the fans because there was so much exposition. There were so many bits that were clearly catching up people who didn't remember the series so well. And Yeah, I think it was definitely aimed at the casual fan as well as the hardcore fan. But, you know, as I say, I haven't really read it for ages. There were parts I didn't remember, so the reminders were definitely there to remind us. But I don't think if you... I think there was the expectation that if you didn't care about Harry Potter, you wouldn't be here. So it was made to be accessible to people who hadn't read Harry Potter, or was this really a fan-only event? I don't think you'd be able to really follow if you hadn't read it ever, 
maybe if you'd just seen the movies, you'd be fine. But there were a few kind of concepts that were there and weren't explained. Like the time turner, which is what they used to do, the big time travel plot, or the Dementors weren't really explained further than just they look the same as they do in the movies. A lot of stuff looked the same as it did in the movies, to be honest. They were definitely, you know, playing for people who'd only seen the movies. Like Hagrid was obviously very heavily modelled after the Robbie Coltrane version. The woman they had playing Professor McGonagall, whose name I sadly don't have access to, could have been Maggie Smith, to be honest because if it was supposed to be far back, she was clearly dressed up and doing the accent. So the production values lived up to the film because obviously there's a there's a sort of difference moving it from stage to film. Oh yeah, that was incredibly impressive. I was a huge theatre nerd in high school, university. I went to see a lot of productions of different things. I've never seen anything like that. They did stuff that was really genuinely just quite impressive. They got claps for the special effects. At some point, they took Polyjuice Potion, which is where you transform into someone else, and they just wiggled in their robes a bit, and another actor appeared. It was quite seamless. Yeah, and there was at least one bit where these Polyjuice people disguised as the older actors, and they just, honest to God, I think they must, I mean, even as someone who's aware it's a play and, you know, is vaguely looking to see the moving strings, because I think that's just what you kind of do. I couldn't see how the actors got from one side of a stage to the other quickly enough to actually be both characters in that scene. It was so impressive, it genuinely lost me completely. I was like, wow, that's amazing. So it really did live up to the uh, the films in that regard. Yeah, there was a, there was like a, a little fighty action scene on top of a train at one point. It was properly cinematic. I don't know if they're doing a film. I think there was a rumor, and then I think there was a denial. I don't know. But if, if they ever do do a film, it will translate quite well, I think. Yeah, there's a special effect that they did. Um, they travel through fireplaces like they do in the series, and the actors would just shoot out of there, which is not <laughs> particularly weird or difficult to imagine how they did it. But then, like, flames would erupt an instant later and I was just I can't imagine how no one caught on fire when they were rehearsing it because it was just so fast yeah and for some reason the one effect I kept noticing which really impressed me is that whenever they time travelled because as as Claire mentioned earlier there's a lot of time travel that was wonderful there was the, the spinning clocks around the stage to bits of dialogue from the, the rest shimmer. of the play. The shimmer, yes. The actual on-screen time tra- travel screen shimmer. Yeah. Wow, that's I impressive. don't know how they did that. That was wonderful. No, that was, again, that was properly cinematic. I really I really enjoyed that. I mean, to us, it was so good, I actually came out the storyline a bit to think, my God, they, they did the shimmer on a stage. But... <laughs> Yeah, it was good. So are there any ways that, they had, that you think the story was different for being on the stage rather than being a book? I mean, obviously, this is the first time we've seen Harry Potter on the stage. So did that affect the narrative or the story they were telling? I think the very beginning of the play kind of struggled from having to establish very quickly where we were in the narrative relative to the main series and maybe that on stage was difficult because they pick up exactly where the epilogue of the whole series is. They repeat that, which is a bit tedious if you actually know it, <laughs> and I had just finished my reread, so... Mm. And then they go through a few years of them taking the train to school because we are in mainly their fourth year, I think, at the school. Yeah. It's just that first 10, 15 minutes was just a bit a bit more tedious. Yeah, they kept doing these little time jumps. For some reason, just because you had the people standing there on the stage, I don't know, it just seemed a bit weird and clunky that they were passing through years in seconds and rather than it just being any kind of continuous narrative. You suppose you can skip over time more subtly in a book so you can kind of flow from, from time period to time period with prose, whereas... Any kind of visual medium that has to be like a moment of interchange, which can be jarring. Yeah, that was just mm. one bit where I could really think, okay, this would probably work reasonably well in a film, because I don't know, you could have it as sort of a fun little montage over the top of the credits or something. But in a play, it was just a bit, okay, was, the plot just isn't really taking hold yet, are we? We're just sort of drifting away towards it. I mean, the thing is, if you're going to do exposition in a way uh, that's just dialogue between characters, you either have to show us something... Or you have to have dialogue where the character says, as you know, Bob, <laughs> which is not good, right? And so they had to show us because they couldn't, there was no way to tell us that would have made sense. I guess they could have just jumped straight in on his fourth year, but there'd surely have been a way for someone to reference the fact that he was in Slytherin. Which is also really funny because they have that as their first, like, kind of plot twist. Oh my god, Albus Severus Potter is in Slytherin, which is something that the internet has theorized almost since the day that the seventh book came out and had this epilogue where he worries about it, it's just become such a, a fan-like fact almost that 
it was weird that they made such a big deal out of it. Well, yeah, I don't know if J.K. Rowling wrote the epilogue and then just threw that in as a fun bit of dialogue and then went away and thought later, actually, hmm, or whether she always thought, maybe I'll come back to that. Oh, no, she always did. Joe Rowling wants to keep going back into that world and she has said a long time ago that if she ever did, it would be for Albus Severus. The rest of the kids dis- <laughs> disappear, disappeared <laughs> a bit, didn't they? <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> they just disappeared. Particularly in the second play. In the second play, where the, the, the ships has hit the fan, and Albus and his mate Scorpius, who's Draco Malfoy's kid, have gone on this big time travel adventure, and basically the original three heroes plus Draco are off looking for him. Like Ron, Hermione, and Harry, and Draco are off looking for these two kids. At some point, you do sort of think, I wonder what's happened to Harry's other two children while he's going on and on and on about being a better father to this one specific one, completely ignoring the other two. Was it Ron and Hermione have a, a daughter called Rose? Does she just disappear as well? Pretty much. Rose disappears as part of the plot, though. It's a traditional time travel thing where we go back to change one thing, and of course we change many more things, and one of the things that changes is that Rose Weasley disappears because Ron and Hermione aren't married anymore because of something. It's... It's a bit flimsy, but it's a fairly traditional trope of st- of time travel stories. So it works. But yeah, the part of the impetus of going to fix it is to get Rose back. At least for Scorpius, who fancies her. I did a tweet in the morning before we saw part one, in which I did a joke about how I hoped they borrow some X-Men time travel tropes that do the Age of Voldemort. And... For those of you who know what the Age of Apocalypse is, that's basically the plot. It is, they go back in time, change something, and then Voldemort now rules the planet. When I looked at the plot, I thought they have basically borrowed the plot of Back to the Future 2. In the, of, yeah, as Claire said, yeah. most time travel stories. They travel back to the Goblet of Fire, don't they? And the Tri-Wizard Tournament. So they weave their time travel plot line round an existing plot line. Then they create a dystopian alternative future where everything's worse. And then they have to travel back to their original time travel event to reset the clock to be what it was supposed to be in inverted commas yes that's um, which is in a nutshell that is the plot of back to the future 2 <laughs> it's the plot of age of apocalypse it's i mean i mean aside from just the opening of the first play the other part i felt was maybe a bit weak was the part of the opening of the second play where he they basically did every time travel story on fast forward it's like there was about three scenes where it's like oh look he's found the resistance oh look they've tried to do something Oh look, some known characters have died. Oh look, they've succeeded. End of time travel section. I don't know, because I feel like that was supported by the fact that you know the characters and you can kind of... It's fun to imagine what they would be in another universe. You know, it's obviously the time travel trope of what would this person be if the world had gone differently. But it's also kind of emotional because you find that Snape is still in the resistance and he's with Ron and Hermione and then they sacrifice themselves and you know I mean they're characters we love and they're fighting still the same war that they've been fighting for 20 years and now they sacrifice themselves there there was some emotional weight to it it's just for me it was only undercut by this kind of unfortunate gender politics that often happens in Harry Potter where JK Rowling is clearly not trying to say that but at the same time you know if Hermione doesn't marry Ron, she doesn't get to, like, have a cool life. But if she marries Ron, she gets to be Minister of Magic because, like, he's magical or something. And if she doesn't marry Ron, she becomes a sad bit of old spinster, shouting at people in Hogwarts. Which isn't helped by the fact that they've cast a black Hermione, and therefore if she doesn't marry Ron, she becomes an angry black woman. <laughs> <laughs> She's just... I really liked her acting, though, and I really thought they put in emotional moments in there with this couple that we've been rooting for for a really long time, and it does tug at the heartstrings when they're kind of trying to navigate not being married, but it was just still a bit annoying. It's true. I did like the the handling of the Hermione Von stuff, and even though I know a lot of people say, oh, Hermione Von will clearly get divorced about ten years later, or just break up about ten minutes later. But I don't know. I like the fact that they didn't, you know, try and bolt Ron onto some pivotal role in the ministry. They did just say, well, look, he was always the slightly less academic, underachieving one. Now he's a stay-at-home husband who works in a joke shop and mostly contributes to the plot by standing around making... Oh, no, he was amazing. He was brilliant. The guy, Both the guy playing him and the way they used him. I thought, yeah, go wrong. No, no, I really loved him as a character in the play. It's just kind of funny to me that if he doesn't marry Hermione, he still marries his very first girlfriend from school because that's what everybody does. 
in this universe, yes, it is. Mm. It's a good job no one's worked this out, so it would be very pressuring on those early dates since the teenager. <laughs> I can imagine Harry Potter has created some unrealistic expectation of high school romance for a lot of people. <laughs> I'm sure they, they'll become disillusioned quickly enough, but... To move on to another plot point, I think one of the only major ones we haven't that these vaguely referenced, the Delphine thing. Is it Delphine? Delphi? I think it's Delphi. She's introduced as this romantic interest for Albus Potter and then turns out to be not only the villain, but also the secret daughter of Voldemort, <laughs> which is such a ridiculous plot twist. I loved it because it was just so completely... It was just so indulgent. It was just so completely over the top. I've been in this specific Phantom for a really long time, and I've since. Ah, I'm sorry. I've seen. I've seen. I've so seen I've been... some things, man. I've seen some things. <laughs> exactly. Voldemort having sex sounds blood curdlingly terrifying. But Voldemort having sex with Bellatrix Lestrange, no less. I don't know if that means anything to you, Alistair, but it's disturbing. And it's Helena Bonacar. I'm probably quite kinky, to be honest. It's it wasn't Bonacarta. going to be with anything else. Anything with, else. It wasn't going to be with anybody else, though, was it? Because it was quite obvious in the books and in the movies that Bellatrix Lestrange wanted inside those pants pretty bad. Inside that massive shapeless pyjama robe thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that. With the feel that nose cavity on her cheeks. But anyway. Mm. They had to tell Helena Bonham Carter to tone it down with the sexiness because it was a children's film. Tone it down, for God's sake. He's basically a skeleton. A lizard skeleton. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, but I mean, I've been in this fandom for a really long time, and that was my first fandom, so when I first started reading fic and theories and stuff about the books when they were still coming out, I was involved in some like pretty ridiculous, indulgent first pieces of storytelling, and one of them was, twist, this character in a role-playing game we have is the secret daughter of Voldemort. <laughs> And, like, that's the kind of thing that I tell people when I reference my first fandom to say how ridiculous it was. It's very soap opera. I mean, Harry Potter's always had a fairly big undercode of soap opera. And to be fair, it was actually a good twist. I mean, I don't really associate JK with massive, it was there all along, but you didn't see it coming twists. She's not, that's not something I've always seen from her. He's not in the Harry Potter books. Well, apart from Sirius Black, really. What? Which bit? Him dying? Well, oh, him not being him not being a baddie? Yes. God, I was so young when I read that, I can't even remember if I was surprised or not. I don't know if I'd quite become as cynical as I am now. But, but I don't know, maybe she's got more into it now, but now she's been writing crime books for a few years. <laughs> yeah, the revelation that Delphi... Delphi? Yeah, Delphi. ...is the daughter of Voldemort happens in the second play. The first play, she's genuinely just there in a quite a boring, I'm there partly because we need to have a trio and partly because love interest. And I quite like the fact that it wasn't that. I quite like the fact that there was something a little bit more. I just think the vehicle of a play maybe doesn't afford for enough uh, subtlety to bring something this big <laughs> and this sop opera -y, like you said. I mean, I, I quite liked it. I thought the twist of, I'm just boring. No, I'm not. Actually, they did pull it off. I mean, Ad Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. fans out there, it was basically the Agent Ward twist. He's boring, he's boring, he's boring. No, he's not. And you didn't see it because you just thought he was boring. The one interesting bit about it was that when they were in the kind of like Age of Voldemort bit of the play, they kept referencing the augury. Knowing J.K. Rowling, knowing how she writes and having read the books many, many times, you know that's going to come back. So then when it does come back and then she is the augury and she's also called Delphi, so you kind of think, oh, well, I should have thought of that all along because the augury is a bird of prophecy and Delphi is the oracle of Delphi and so <laughs> everybody has to have a name that means what they're going to be in the story it's how it works nominal determinism really what does Harry Potter mean <laughs> it's not Harry Potter it's like basically everybody else okay. like Umbridge Dolores Umbridge you know the most ancient and noble house of black Remus Lupin is named his wolf wolf <laughs> oh yeah that's good <laughs> I mean, like... That is particularly It's unsubtle. pretty Dickensian. She does that all the time. Yeah. The twist of Delphine, yeah. I, I literally only saw it coming about probably less than a minute or two before she revealed it. That's good. That's, that's I think, a good level of twist. Yeah, that's, that's what, what you, want, you want. The sort of, oh, shit's feeling just before it goes. But mm. unfortunately, I didn't think Delphine had an amazing time of it after that big reveal. I thought she was a bit, greetings, I am a super villain after that. It was, I don't know, she had her little emotional arc. I haven't quite got to grips with whether it was the acting or the words, but I didn't really feel that much interest. There was a lengthy sequence where Delphine talks to Harry disguised as Voldemort about her feelings and there was... I, f I feel like I would have enjoyed that sequence more. It was still quite funny because of Harry pretending to be Voldemort but I feel like I would have enjoyed... <laughs> yeah, I would have got more out of that sequence if I 
really bought into Delphine's feelings and not just found them a bit annoying. Isn't there a formal setup in that there's a rumour going around Hog- Hogwarts that Scorpius Malfoy is actually Voldemort's son? I mean, he gets bullied for it. Mm, the problem with that, though, is that we are introduced to the rumour of Scorpius being maybe Voldemort's son in the very beginning of the play because Albus is going to sit with Scorpius on the train because the, comp- the compartment is empty. And Scorpius says, you do not want to sit with me because of that rumour that exists. You totally know that rumour, don't you, about how I'm maybe the son of Voldemort, but <laughs> I really am not. And, and it's just so clumsy. And I feel like play or not play, there would have been ways of doing that in like, like a more subtle manner little bit. It does seem odd that he didn't already know the rumour. Well, I guess the rumour might not have been in the respectable papers. Who knows what Harry Potter actually allows his son to read. But the Scorpius was great, though. Scorpius was amazing. Albus was a sort of okay, brave hero, but Scorpius was just fun. I mean, Albus was basically Harry again, right? And he had the same issues as Harry. He had mommy and daddy issues. He was angry and angsty. And then, of course, grown-up Harry, with all the responsibilities of working at the ministry and not seeing his children enough, he's just, like, doubling down on how he usually is in the book, which is just angry about things. Harry's sort of occasional fits of rage seemed a bit weird from a grown man. It was a bit sort of, I could respect this behaviour more from you when you were in puberty, sir. Now you're just... Yelling yeah. at your kids because they mildly disrespected you and it's actually a bit off-putting. But I quite like the fact that they use that for the first reveal of the the consequences of the bit of time travel. Right? They travel back in time, they do their first bit of changing the past, they come back, and then Harry has a discussion with his son where he just like just tears into him and tells him that he's going to prevent him from ever seeing Scorpius, use the Marauder's Map to spy on him, and then, like, use some kind of magic tracker to, like, prevent him from... I mean, you know, some real, like, breach of human (laughs) rights type of stuff, type of spying. That's some serious over-parenting. It was a bit draconian. Oh, Oh, look at that. (laughs) But then you realise that the past was actually changed because he meets Ron and Ron starts talking about his wife Padma and his children who are not his uh, the children that they're used to him having and then you know you've got this like slow realization oh that's why we've got a Harry that's really over the top it's a different Harry and I thought that was quite well done even though you know you just kind of want to slap (laughs) Harry because that's not on yeah I did quite like the vague piece Harry arrived at at the end even though yeah, at the very end where they revisited the bit where Harry's parents die, yet again. Yeah, I was in two minds about it. On the one hand, again, I thought I feel like they should get away with from the same bit of mythology at some point. But on the other hand, I guess it's only a one-off comeback. They can't really, you know, establish a bold new tapestry, can they? Ultimately, they just have to keep going back to the same stuff. And I was much less bothered by the fact that they revisit Lily and James's death than by the fact that apparently the point that the entire prophecy of Delphi and the entire, like, play in the entire just going back in time is oh let's go save Cedric Diggory (laughs) which is just it was out of nowhere yeah it was just weird they kind of tried to introduce it in a way but I didn't feel like that worked very well because it just it felt completely out of nowhere what as in why him and not everyone else who died well yeah there's so many points of divergence you could have picked why that one yeah I mean also I'm personally annoyed that you didn't choose to save Sirius Black or Remus Lupin or you know Fred Weasley (laughs) like You have a time turner. (laughs) Maybe saving Cedric, they hope they would save everyone else by somehow making everything better. I don't know. I mean, this is sort of imposing how I feel about the narrative on the actual narrative. I mean, this is getting quite wanky, isn't it? I mean, Cedric Mm -hmm. died first. Cedric's death felt more tragic because off the top of my head, I think he was the first major death. His death was quite a big sort of this is serious kids moment and therefore I think people look back at it and think that was sad that was the first time I felt really (laughs) well what was that that was a horse noise when reading a Harry Potter book and obviously he was played by the amazing Robert Pattinson who again they they, of the beautiful hair they found an actor again they found an actor who looked a bit like Pattinson and gave him the same hair yeah so I I guess I could see the appeal of like we want a big obvious clear death everyone will remember oh how about the first major death during the big exciting Voldemort's resurrected scene which is still also and scary even now. And, you know, it is also something that came across as very cruel in the book because Voldemort does call him the spare yeah. and there's no reason for him to die and he dies because Harry and him are both being so brave and refusing to win without the other and all of that. And, of course, it's the death that gives Harry 
the first bit of PTSD that he keeps having all the way through the books because he's seen someone die and he's 14 and Hogwarts doesn't believe in therapists. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess there's that. It's a lot of the, the subsequent deaths were combatants who had knowingly entered a battle and then died in it, more or less. Mm. And they, all they, they were put themselves intentionally, yeah, well, well, kids or grown-ups, they put themselves knowingly into dangerous situations, whereas Cedric, I imagine, was not expecting to actually die as a result of entering a supervised school sporting event. So, yeah, you could argue that he's the biggest victim. It seems like quite a complex story that the play tells. I know it is, obviously, it's two, two-and-a-half-hour plays. I mean, you've got to establish this new world 19 years on from the original and then multiple different versions of it some which are more dystopian than others and then also concurrent plots running in different times of this sort of strange new world so it does sound like it's a lot to keep track of do you think that worked well yeah i mean i'm not going to make the facetious point of did this need to be two plays because yeah obviously for this amount of plot it probably did need to be two plays fair enough yeah and i think it worked the things that they introduced that were new from the series that we know were mainly what people are doing now so we've got ron the house husband hermione who is minister for magic and harry who's the head of the department for magical law enforcement and then we establish what house they are in at Hogwarts and it's Scorpius and Albus and Slytherin being miserable at school and then everybody else in Gryffindor. I guess what I find a little bit annoying about the entire setup is not that it was too complicated or difficult to follow or whatever. It's just that like you feel like no lessons have been learned from the entire book series, which was all about how, you know, we should all be friends and like maybe not hate people just because they're in Slytherin says she has a Slytherin yeah I, I, I don't know I guess you could, there's always a point of teenagers will just be teenagers sometimes it's just horrible to be a teenager and I mean Albus seemed to be as down on himself for being in Slytherin as a lot of the other kids were to be honest I don't know how much to what extent he was very much putting his own suffering on himself do you think there's an element that J.K. Rowling wanted to redeem Slytherin putting the two main characters in Slytherin this time, as if to say Slytherin aren't just all evil. Heroes can come from Slytherin. I think that's definitely in there. Yeah, I think so, because she's said that kind of thing before in some of the kind of paratexts, some of the stuff that surrounds what she does now with the series, which is mostly the website Pottermore. So she's definitely announced, you know, oh, this cool wizard from history was definitely a Slytherin, that kind of thing. And she was already trying to do that at the end of the of the series with Professor Slughorn, who's kind of like a bit slimy, but also not a Death Eater. And Draco's in there again, being a bit of a, a hard ass, but you know, it's it's made very clear, not a bad guy. And a much better dad than Harry is. Yeah, to be honest, yeah. And also he gets, along with Ron, he gets most of the funny lines. Yeah, and they did put in a few nods to the various uh, ships that are popular on the internet, which, which was kind of amusing. It's part of that bit of the play that was definitely for the people who enjoy Harry Potter. But there's, there's a moment where he talks about how much uh, he doesn't mind being bossed around by Hermione, <laughs> which... Uh, which was very much appreciated. <laughs> There's a part where they talk about how, how a lot of stuff seemed to happen in his fifth year, which as someone who thinks book five was far too long, I appreciate it. <laughs> There's also a bit where uh, he uh, talks to Harry about how... Um... So the, the, the first time turner that they've been using is malfunctioning and it lasts only five minutes and Draco has one that's much better and he talks to Harry about how Malfoy tech doesn't last only five minutes, which was funny. <laughs> So you mentioned that the actor playing Malfoy and the actor playing Ron Weasley were both very good. Is there any other performances that really stood out? Is, could you choose a favourite performance? Uh, um, I think the kid playing Scorpius was pretty good. Uh, I don't think anyone stuck out. We were relatively far back, so I couldn't, I, I couldn't necessarily deliver a lengthy advance critique of everyone's act touring. To be honest, I think everyone was pretty good. Yeah, I would agree with that. I definitely want to try and get some of the kind of like uh, lottery tickets that you can try and enter for, where they're much closer to the stage and they're not exorbitantly pricey, uh, which the normal ones are. But I definitely want to go back with better seats so that I can actually see the acting. But from what we were able to see... It was quite good. There were some scenes that were just particularly hard hitting whenever they were on moving staircases. There's a Ron and Hermione scene like that and a Scorpius Albus scene like that that were both just really, really moving, I thought. Yeah, and yeah, and much as I've made, made fun of Harry for handling his fathering of teenagers, much like he himself is a teenager, yeah, there were some quite sad bits about him getting older and 
try to embrace his adult life a bit. Quite nice. I felt bad for him at times. The actor playing Harry just felt like Harry to me. And same with the actor playing Ron. I think it was a bit more difficult for the actress who played Hermione because so much of Hermione in the books is about studying and about book knowledge and that kind of thing. And like she was much more in an action role uh, as the minister for magic and then as a resistance combatant and whatever. It wasn't as much of the exact same thing that you would expect Hermione from Hogwarts age to to be saying but she was also great in general as an actor it was just a bit more difficult to recognize her character in there so if we hadn't managed to get tickets would you have read the book of this or would you have just tried to avoid spoilers until you could eventually see it no I would have read the book because you can't avoid spoilers that long I got actually spoiled for something even even then, even being really careful and even having tickets to one of the previews, I got spoiled for something, so... Yeah, I, I don't think I got spoiled for anything, although looking back at my funny time travel tweets, maybe I did read that somewhere and then I just somehow repressed it. But yeah, I, I don't know if I would have read the play, because I've never found it that easy to read like scripts and really feel it much. I'd, I'd probably have tried in a really futile way to actually wait till I could see it. A play is very much a blueprint of what you're seeing. It's not a substitute for seeing it. And also there'll be degrees to which they'll in- interpret it live, change things around. It's very much like the difference between looking at the designs of something and the finished article. And I think there are things in the play that are also really, really, really specific that kind of... I'm not sure I'm going to be able to read the script now without hearing the actor who plays Scorpius because he had like a very specific diction and he had very specific mannerisms that he was doing. I wasn't extremely fond of those all of the time, but I think they were specific enough that it will stick when I'm reading the script and so that interpretation also kind of colors it obviously so did these new characters that they've created they were able to stand sort of by themselves or was there a degree to which they were overshadowed by the characters we know and love from the books were you just waiting for harry and hermione to turn up i think most people went away thinking scorpius was awesome so probably not yeah i would agree with that i mean mostly mostly scorpius was the best new character like I said, I think Albus is pretty much Harry again. So I think outside of Scorpius and Albus, they didn't really fully develop that many new characters. Rose Weasley was pretty much Hermione. They made jokes about her liking academics and whatever as if she were Hermione. So, you know. Isn't she also a star Quidditch player, though? Oh, yeah, she is. That's true. <laughs> so in many ways, she's better than Hermione. Ooh, careful what you say. I'm not going to say that much positive about Rose Weasley because outside of the first, like, 20 minutes of the first play, she was barely in it, was she? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I assumed at the first they were going to be do the Trinity with Scorpius, Albus and Rose, and I guess because that was probably too obvious, they didn't, and then they sort of did a feint at doing it at Delphine. What I found a bit sad, though, was that they introduced Albus and Scorpius as really not enjoying school and really, like, being lonely and whatever and really kind of wishing that they didn't have to be there. And um, by the end of the play, I don't feel like they've really resolved that. And it seems like a big deal in the life of a school-aged teenager. I think there was one last scene after the, the action finished with Scorpius and Albus at school when they were meant to be a bit more at ease, wasn't it? Then they were sort of larking around on the stairs talking about girls or whatever it was. Yeah. Then, I don't know. It, it, you're right, they didn't mm. really get into the psychology of it much, There was, a, but they seemed to be a bit less... <sighs> to use the technical term. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then they had another lengthy scene to resolve Harry's daddy issues. Then, yeah, because they spent so long on bringing in all the old characters, then they didn't really have time to build up many new ones other than the core two and, well, I guess sort of Delphi, but I, as I said, I'm not sure if she quite got enough time. Are there any characters you'd wished they'd had time uh, for that they didn't? I know. Remus. Luna. Luna, yeah, Luna. Because, yeah, I mean, a lot of it Agreed. was a bit of a sort of... Like, whenever they had an excuse, they brought in an old a book character. Like, you know, part of me feels like a lot of the lengthy time travel detour was because they felt they couldn't do it without having Snape turn up in some way. Yeah, there was a couple of Hagrid cameos, which, to be honest, were probably not plot essential, but it was nice to see him. Yeah, I just really didn't like the uh, accent that the guy who played him was doing, so I was I just... Think he, was just try- he was trying to do the one that Bobby Coltrane does, wasn't he? It's just Scottish accent. Yeah. They also mentioned Neville a couple times and had jokes about him, but didn't bring him in, actually, as a presence on stage, and that was also a bit sad. I know I want all the characters who were dead to come back, like Remus Lupin, who I love, but Luna and Neville were the main, like, still living people that we didn't see that just... I would have liked to see. Well, but there was some Neville love in the room. If I, in that one bit in the alternate reality scene where someone mentioned the fact that Neville was dead in this alternate reality, and the whole auditorium went. <gasps> <gasps> 
that but made me laugh. Neville is amazing. Why would there not be Neville loving that? I know, and I like that, that one token bit of sort of Neville appreciation in that, yeah, Cedric Diggory surviving meant that he became a bitter Death Eater and killed Neville, and obviously the lack of Neville meant the world was doomed. Well, yeah. So, yeah, even if I didn't manage to get Neville a walk on, although it's really weird they didn't manage to get him a walk on, considering his backstory was. Not his backstory, his end of book story was that he was a Hogwarts teacher. I mean, like half the play takes place mm-hmm. at Hogwarts. Would it have hurt? <laughs> anyway. And I mean, you can see from the quick explanation that Nick just gave about like the consequences of things happening, that was one of the things that allowed them to cover so much ground in the play, but also one of the things that felt a little bit flimsy because, you know, you've got Ron talking about his wife... Padma and and suddenly they wonder how come he didn't marry Hermione and then you've got this like super long explanation of well Hermione was mad at Victor Crumb because of something you did in the past so she didn't go to Yule Ball with him and so she went with Ron as a friend and he wasn't jealous so then when he danced with Padma and it's just like it <laughs> doesn't really flow very well as, as you know yeah I mean, this is like partly what I, I meant at the, back at the very beginning by a fan wank. A lot of it did seem to be written vaguely around the concept of how many old characters can we fit in? Yeah, but obviously when you're just here to, you know, immerse yourself in Harry Potter one more time, maybe even one last time, who knows, and mm-hmm. you don't have time to build up a whole new mythology, yeah, getting around the old characters of the old mythology is fair enough. I liked it when Dumbledore turned up to deliver an inspiring lecture from a painting. And again, it's one of those things where it's like when they have Snape show up. <laughs> When you have Dumbledore and when you have Snape, when you have those characters that you've evolved with them through seven books to the end where it's like, well, they did some good things, but they did some bad things too. And some of those things were motivated by good, but some of these things were motivated by being power hungry or still being in love with a girl that you've been obsessed with since you were 11 that like never dated you you know there's things about both of these characters that we having grown up with harry potter have now come to realize are extremely unhealthy not good things and yet they are still treated in the same way as heroes dumbledore kind of apologizes to harry for being a terrible father figure and therefore leaving harry in this position where he's really not equipped to dealing with one of his children and still harry says no no you were great and i love you and whatever and then of course you meet snape and it's like snape you're a great resistance fighter you're a great hero and it's like well would he really still be fighting the fight if Harry Potter had died and Voldemort was now in charge, because the only reason he ever did it was to save Harry to honor Lily's memory. So, does he deserve to have like a big fan salute and like a big sacrificial death to protect our heroes? I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm sure there was at least one bit where they did do a sort of, I can't remember the exact dialogue sadly but there was a bit of a sort of a rambling bit about Snape sort of, yeah yeah great man good man you know, some, some flaws great man but it sort of awkwardly tried to vaguely engage with the idea that Snape is you know not, not always the most purely motivated character but yeah I don't feel I, I feel like ultimately it was you were just basically meant to think oh it's Snape hey. well yeah also I think Snape is one of the characters that has the biggest difference between like who he is in the book and who he is in the films. And in the films, in a big part because he is Alan Rickman, he is much more like likable character. So if that's what they're going for, then that makes more sense to me. But I've just reread the books and he's a terrible abusive man. Well, yeah, again, much like a lot of the other returning characters, he was very Alan Rickman styled. Mm. I, I think it is meant to be a canonical continuation of the book so I'm sure the, the Vickman styling is just a shorthand for people who haven't read the books to go look that is Snape I guess they want to make these well established characters as instantaneously recognisable well yeah I mean you can't do it for 12 years of exposition on everything they've got to finish the play eventually were there many children uh, in the audience with you do you think this is something that appears more to people who read Harry Potter when they were young grew up with it and are now invested in more, or is this the sort of thing that's bringing in new young people into the Harry Potter fandom? I don't remember a massive amount of children. I think there were definitely some children, though. The thing is, even people who got into Harry Potter as kids are now old enough to have their own children that they might bring with them, so it's difficult to say, but I definitely saw some uh, younger people. By Harry Potter standards, it wasn't even a particularly one of the darker stories, so I'm sure a child could turn up and enjoy definitely. it fine. What about plot complexity or number of characters? I mean, you can have a, you can be adult in content without being adult in content. 
I don't know. I mean, to be honest, that level of time travel story, I've seen it on a lot of sort of relatively mainstream sort of teen and up dramas. I don't think, I mean, an actual proper less than 10 years old child might have had trouble following it. I think kids are perfectly capable of understanding slightly complex narratives. I mean, I'm I'm no expert. I can't, I couldn't tell you an age where I think this, it becomes easy to follow for people that age, but I don't really see why it would be particularly difficult because like I said, there is a lot of exposition explaining to you what's happening as it's going on. Yeah, I think as long as you have at least a passing familiarity with the basic plot and concepts of Harry Potter, you'll probably be basically okay. Well, that's all we've got time for. Nick, any anything to sum up? It's definitely good fun. I think, to be honest, although it has its flaws, as I think we've now discussed at length, but ultimately, if you're a Potter fan, or, the, or even a Potter sort of casual fan mild enjoyer i think there's there's stuff here it's very good natured it's got a lot of the the sort of the charm and the humor you want from jk Rowling. so yes if you have the time the money and the opportunity and you like harry potter then yeah i think probably go see this i think you probably won't regret it yeah it definitely uh made me very happy i teared up a little bit at some point there was some scary moments i laughed a lot I'm overall very, very happy that I went. And I'm very happy that we are having more Harry Potter things. It's a bit weird that we've had a number of years without anything and now we have this play and we have a film coming and we have just more things to kind of reignite this fandom, which was my first fandom. And like that just makes me really happy. I can't wait for more theories and more fan art and more fanfic and more just content around Harry Potter to happen in my internet which uh, i'm confident it will <laughs> yeah yeah oh i've actually half forgotten about fantastic beasts that actually is a whole new mythology isn't it that's going to be interesting or oh. well, maybe we'll get claire back to discuss that when it comes out yes <laughs> that works <laughs> yes so yeah, thank you for coming on do you want to now say where people can find you and plug some stuff or something like that yeah so i'm a booktuber i have a youtube channel where i talk about books mostly science fiction and fantasy books and a bunch of attendant geeky stuff as well and I'm also on the Twitter and those are both at uh, Claire Russo which uh, I trust you will put in the description box or something because it is a bit difficult to spell. Yeah yeah it'll be in the iTunes show notes and the we'll link it up on the website and stuff. Yeah if you're here strictly for the Harry Potter Claire's been doing some videos actually rereading and revisiting the books which are good fun. Next, we'll be discussing Star Trek Beyond, the 13th Star Trek film and the third since they rebooted the franchise with a new, younger cast. In this film, the Enterprise is ambushed and destroyed. Kirk and his crew escape but are divided. They find themselves on a hostile planet ruled over by Kroll, who's determined to find an ancient weapon that Kirk has hidden. Uh, We went to see it last week. Nick, what did you think? Well, my notes begin with the phrase, tidy as fuck, which I think sums up most of what I have to say. Yeah, I think that is a quite neat summary of the film. I, it was a very, very, like, sleek, mechanical, well-made action film. Like, you know, all the characters moved into it, had something to do it, it was very, very cleanly told. I think the director, Justin Lin, is known previously for Faster Than the Furious films or film, isn't he? At least one of them. I think he did Fast and the Furious 7. They are films that, again, are quite neat, quite tight and very entertaining. You know, they're sort of professional jobs. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of big action sequences. They're all very clearly told. Most of the characters had decent amounts to do. A couple, I felt, got a bit neglected, but I'll complain about that later. Yeah, it, it started. They introduced the MacGuffin in a way that didn't feel too artificial. They had a, a bit of character bantery interplay, and then there was a tiny bit of building up subplots. Then it went straight into the action, straight into the sort of on-planet survival stuff. Yeah, the camaraderie worked, which I think... I mean, I'm not a massive Star Trek person, to be honest. I haven't really seen that much of it outside of a handful of films. I mean, the only Star Trek thing I've seen in its entirety is now this film franchise, these three films in the J.J. Abrams franchise, which I think is now called the Kelvin timeline, formally, to differentiate it from the Prime timeline. All oh, right, I didn't know that. That's good. Yeah, this is now the Kelvin timeline, because I think the upcoming Brian Fuller TV show, which I think is starting early next year, is set back in the Prime timeline. Yeah, Star Trek Discovery. That's the one. Whereas this is, yeah, this is this is its own standalone thing. It felt a bit like a sort of routine adventure, but to be honest, in a lot of these franchise films, you never get to see a routine adventure. Everything has to be, you know, this is it. Everything's been building up to this. You thought you were happy, but now you'll be sad. Yeah. If you're going to make film series that are basically big budget TV series, you do occasionally need to have these if you want people to actually give a damn. To be honest, I kind of wish they'd put this one out before Into Darkness, 
so that we gave a bit more of a shit when Benedict Cumberbatch came along to do the now you were sad thing. Yeah, there were some things that kind of made this, I guess, an exceptional event in the lives of the characters. Like there's there's quite a lot of character drama in that. Kirk's thinking about leaving the Enterprise and becoming sort of having a permanent base. He's getting tired of wandering the stars. Spock is also considering leaving the Enterprise and going back to, to New Vulcan, you know, and the, and the ship gets destroyed so there's like the theme is very much they're being divided and broken apart sort of physically and like psychologically as characters and then through the story itself again they kind of find their camaraderie and their unity and then and come together for the uh the final conflict yeah you're right it's a it's a good by the numbers action movie it's, it's very well made and very entertaining it's only worth going to see I mean, it wasn't too long, which was good, as there's definitely films and action movies seem to be getting longer and longer. This one was quite you know, tight and not too long. It was only like an hour and 40 minutes. It didn't need to be two hours, and it wasn't two hours, which I was very glad about. You know, there was, it was, I thought it was very well paced as well, which is, again, pacing underrated skill in filmmaking. Usually you only notice the pacing when it's bad, like Independence Day Resurgence, which was terribly paced, just like <laughs> way, way too fast. Or Batman vs Superman, that was just way too slow and ponderous for a film that was like two and a half hours. It really didn't need to be that slow. Uh, but this, yeah, this was, it was well paced. It was, you know, entertaining throughout each scene, like drove to the next scene. The plot sort of whisked you along. It was very well made in that sense. So yeah, it was, it had humour as well couple of funny moments simon Pegg was good as scotty and also good at co-writing this one and injecting some humor and accessibility into the franchise and the most substantial scotty plot line yet funnily enough yeah well if you're writing i guess that, right, it com- yeah. that comes with one of the privileges of being the writer he also managed to get a line for the tv show spaced into star trek but he didn't give it to himself no he didn't give it to himself that may be going too far yeah i particularly enjoyed carl urban as bones and zachary quinto as spock actually spock especially actually i think spock is i don't really know it would be an easy character to do as sort of an impression of leonard nimoy or sort of a, a cliched stereotype of the emotionless alien vulcan but zachary quinto i think really injects it with just enough humanity to make it work no that is a difficult thing to achieve and it's very hard to step into leonard nimoy's shoes there's a few tributes to leonard nimoy and and spock during this film which were quite touching for the fans I also agree with you that Carl Urban was great as Bones. I mean, he just he does the whole thing with this sort of slight manic edge that he's like constantly on the verge of completely freaking out, and it's just very entertaining to watch. Well, exactly, he's he's grumpy, but never in a I don't know negative or annoying way. He's always just slightly on edge. Yeah, done really well. Chris Pine's very good as Kirk. He could have done a you know William Shatner impression, but he finds a way to make the character his own. This sort of younger, a bit more of a hothead Kirk, and he's very entertaining as the the centre of the story that everything gets built around. Yeah, I mean, I've seen Chris Pine get shit on the internet for his acting. But I, I don't really have a problem with him as the centre of this film. I thought he sold the sort of vaguely emotional bit at the start. And I guess, as I say, because this was a bit of a routine adventure, he didn't really have to do any hard, elaborate, difficult emotions. No, everyone, everyone was good. One of the only criticisms would be that some characters didn't get much of a role. I think it was a pretty good example of an ensemble film, how they used all of the kind of quite large cast of characters quite well. There was, you know, a few characters, I guess, who didn't get much to do. I mean, Uhura didn't have much of a plot in this film. No, I thought it was a bit of a shame when they dropped everyone onto the alien planet and split them all off into little groups to go and have little mini-adventures. They decided to give the one woman in the regular cast the job of getting captured by the villain and being plodded around the base, being told about his evil plan. Yeah, unfortunately, not a particularly interesting role. Yeah, I don't know. It seemed, considering they had, like, about five or six men and one woman, they could have at least let one of the men get captured and let the woman actually, you know, go and wander around a bit. They did yeah. introduce the new character, Jayla, who was the sort of badass alien woman they meet on the surface of the planet, who was a bit sort of badass alien woman cliche, but they gave her enough sort of little nuances and quirks and character bits and little fun camaraderie with Scotty to make it sort of work. Yeah, I think, I think it worked. Anton Yelchin was also good as Chekhov. There's quite a lot of him in this film, which... In some ways, it's nice because sadly it's his last film because he also died during the making of it. He died about a month or so ago, didn't he? So I assume they'd finished making the film at that stage. Yeah, no, you're right. You know, it's nice that he has got more of a role in this one. Like again, Sulu didn't have much to do in this film, but I guess there may be more Sulu in the next film. Partly because they've announced they're not going to recast Chekhov; they're just going to continue without the character. Yeah, because like, he got to accompany Kirk in his bits when they all got split off, which at least meant he got to you know say some things. Yeah, which was good. But yeah, Sulu, of course, there was a bit of pre-release faff about Sulu turning out to be gay in the Kelvin timeline. Yeah. Which, matter for all of one scene, yeah, it's a good good progressive moment, although for all the fuss made out of it in advance, it turned out to be a bit of a blip in the actual film. Yeah, it wasn't really a major plot point or things like that. It was just because when the villain at the end is trying to destroy the big 
space station where loads of you know the federation people live you know it humanizes a bit when it's you know you know that like yeah you get one shot of sulu's husband running away from it yeah with their daughter and then you know it, it humanizes it it's more than just a big mass of people we know there's like even minor characters who are connected to important characters you know adds a bit more emotional weight and obviously uh idris elba i thought was was really good as the uh the villain crawl one of my main rules of uh, making action movies if i was to ever make one is cast your best actor as the villain because it's it's always good to have a really good actor doing this kind of over the top big performance which uh, villains usually call for and uh, and idris elba did not disappoint in this film yeah i disagree slightly i mean i think i mean yes he's definitely the sort of actor you should cast as a villain because he's known for these very big hands wavy shouty theatrical performances but I didn't really feel like, except for maybe a little bit at the very end, he didn't really get much chance to give one. He was buried in prosthetics a bit. Yeah, I think also they didn't handle his character's backstory particularly well. Just towards the end, there's a sort of shunting in explanation of who he is and what his deal is, basically. And that, that could be done better, I felt. Oh Yeah, as we said at the very start, it's a very tidy film. It's a very streamlined film. Yeah, unusually with a modern action film, honestly. There were parts where I feel like it could actually have been made longer to benefit, which isn't something I often say about films at the moment. Yeah, which I think is you know, one of the good things about this film, that it isn't too long. It could have yeah, benefited from an extra five minutes or something earlier revealing the nature of the villain, so you had, I don't know, you knew more about him during some of the, the confrontations. I don't know, memorable supervillains doesn't seem to be a big, or well, villains or whatever, doesn't seem to be a big trend at the moment, I guess, because a lot of films tend to focus on how amazing the hero is in the name of building a franchise around them whereas the villain's only in it for one film and who cares about them yeah i mean loki's probably the exception that breaks the rule in that tom hiddleston is very good doing that villain yeah in marvel land to be honest after loki the next few memorable villains i can come up with are both from the netflix shows to be honest yeah no exactly so yeah but i don't think it was elba's villain was amazingly memorable i thought he did quite a lot with what he had i just kind of wish they'd given him a bit more and maybe let him perform in slightly less foam rubber there is that, but I thought he did very well with um, with the part. You know, I'm a big fan of Idris Elba. I'm a big fan. I feel I went into this film expecting some Elba and got comparatively little Elba, so maybe I'm just innately disappointed. Yeah, I mean, and there are quite a lot of characters. They managed to make it work as an ensemble pretty well. Some people we could have benefited from seeing more. Yeah, I mean, sure, it did its job in making me want to see these characters more, although due to the slightly stop-start schedules of these films, I've got no idea when we'll next see them more. They have confirmed there'll be a fourth one, I think with Chris Hemsworth back as Kirk's dad or something. Yeah, and and um, I think J.J. Abrams is going to come back to direct the fourth one now that he's finished with Star Wars. Okay, that could be good. I mean, Star Wars was good. Yeah, it was very good. But I think the next Star Wars film has been directed by one of the guys who directed most of Breaking Bad. Uh, Ryan Johnson, I think. Go yeah, Looper. Yeah, which is good. Yeah, it was three years since Star Trek Into Darkness. Hopefully, the action to this seems to have been pretty good. It Certainly on screen, it looks like quite a feel-good film. So I live in hope that they'll want to, you know, channel that momentum into actually getting the new one out in the nearer term future rather than just letting it sit for another three or four years yeah and I, I can imagine they'll want to capitalise on the fact that there's a new Star Trek TV show starting they've just put up all the back catalogue of Star Trek on Netflix so you know there's certainly an enthusiasm building around the sort of Star Trek universe yeah I mean I, I think possibly that's one of the downsides of again as I say making these film series which are adaptations of TV shows in but you know ideally in a storytelling perspective you want to have these sort of mid-season episodes where the crew get to bond and you get to bond with them and fun adventure things happen but it's not necessarily holy shit ends of the world. But on the other hand, when it finishes and, you know, there's not another episode next week. In fact, there's not another episode for three or four years. You can't help but feel a slight sense of, oh. Yeah, it's going to be a while before you get to see more of these characters that we just enjoyed seeing. Yeah, exactly. But I can't put that on this film. It's, as I say, it's, a, it's, a, it's tidy as fuck. That's just the nature of the beast. It's the consequence of a lot of the things I liked about it, yeah. Yeah, the only other criticism, really, of the film is that it didn't really do... It didn't really aspire to a lot it didn't really try to do something original or special with sort of science fiction action cinema it sort of showed up did its job very well and departed before it outstayed its welcome that's not a bad thing but I, you know it didn't really you know push the the genre forwards or like sort of you know, evolve what we were seeing i mean if you compare this film to say you know mad max fury road that came out last year which i thought it was doing something different it was pushing the genre forwards it was you know a visual spectacle that was inspiring and different well i think it was very traditional trek wasn't it i mean i i say this as someone who's seen other people like that on the internet i think there was a goal here of doing something which was very much a homage to classic trek episodes where they get lost on an alien planet that is mostly just a random patch of jungle and a lot of cgi and they meander around a bit and then they defeat a, a menacing but not terrifying villain by that notion onto you're making something that's you know designed to be here's some classic trek for your classic trek needs you're kind of automatically not pushing the genre forward. Yeah, that's, that's a very valid point. This is nothing more than shooting zombie high. It's not their fault. Don't shoot them. 
Okay, last week I recommended Alistair check out the video game based folk music of Rebecca Mays, who published her work on the Escapist website under the content brand name Rebecca Mays Muses. She now records music about spirituality and femininity under the name Bo Huntress, which is still very good, but not as much my kind of thing as this sort of interesting introspective stuff about video games. I say this as someone who doesn't play many video games, but I think she provides an interesting perspective on it, so the fact the actual music is good helps as well. Anyway, I first encountered her on Charlie Booker's Gameswipe when she performs the song Chainsaws and Swear Words, which I think was written for the show, which is why it's a bit short. And yeah, her songs vary between sort of catchy, funny ones and the more thoughtful ones. There were two albums plus an EP out of her video game songs. I'm a big fan. Alistair, what did you think of them? Yeah, she's she's very good. She does really good folk music. What I liked about it is that it's about video games, but there's also some of the songs that are a bit vaguer, I mean, more vague. They're not specific enough that you can kind of bring your own emotions to it and your own, I don't know, experiences. One of the great things about music is that there should be a way for you to take a song and make it personal to you in some way. You can really do that with her music. One of the tracks, Monsters, I thought was a great example of that that you know it is about you know video game monsters but at the same time you know it could just be about psychological monsters you know you can bring your own experiences to the song yeah i mean there's there's a trilogy of songs sort of which are the mirror the machine and the monster which i think are meant to be a, a sort of group of three which do talk about various themes in video games in a more universal way which are among my favorite songs on this yeah i like songs that work on multiple levels like that you can interpret it you know in a sort of more esoteric way that it's about psychological monsters or you can interpret it in a specific way as the the song was written which is good it it means that the uh, the albums sort of stand up to multiple listenings as you can sort of think about the songs in different ways yeah we like a lot of things i come to and end up liking i sort of start with the ones that are sort of quirky and funny like there's a song about the batman game which makes a few jokes about batman and yeah that was talks technically about the actual game and then you sort of listen to that and then you start to grow to more like the songs for though as you say about more universal themes and less about the specifics of actual video games but there's some where she sings about the actual game like it, it's a slick looking game with good weapon play or something and yeah. those are the sort of the catchy fun songs i sort of tend to start with and then i move beyond that yeah i really enjoyed the two albums that you let me i preferred epic win to the outfall they were both good what the first one the longer one yeah and i've also felt that one actually was more specifically about video games that one had more songs that were you know like i think that has the batman one doesn't it which is yeah yeah very specifically about batman winning game of the year the outfall i felt was the songs were again perhaps more vague they were easier for you to kind of in your in your own appreciation of the song make it about something else other than video games it seemed like less specific folk music in that way but it was still a a good album the second one i I mean the second one was shortly before she stopped writing songs about video games so it was perhaps her sort of noodling around a bit trying harder to keep herself interested and eventually just deciding to call it a day i can see that as a sort of yeah departure album one that's a bit more you know a bit less specific it's more accessible to people who are fans of folk music that aren't necessarily into video games. So, yeah, I can see that this is a departure or transition album. Oh, it does include the song Freedom Fighter, which is a, actually quite funny. Yeah. That, sort of sarcastic takedown of video game Freedom Fighters. Uh, that's that's good, yeah. I mean, that's one of the songs I've highlighted as one of my favourites. That was a good song. I also, my other one I really, really liked was UFO. That's on Epic Win. Uh, that was really good. Okay, I was actually going to force you to play a guessing game for which one of the songs on this is one of my actual favourite songs of all time. But is is it? U- it is UFO. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I thought so. Which was that was definitely my um, standout. You know, from all the songs I listened to, that one was yeah, it was really good and, re- and really funny. I did also like the um, Don't Shoot Them. The one about having a kind of more pacifist approach to dealing with zombies. Yeah. Yeah, that was very good. Especially as I've been watching I Zombie recently. I also like the um, Who You Gonna Call one about Ghostbusters. That was, topical, uh, that was very good, very funny. Yeah, and there was the, the song for Yahtzee on the second album, where she directly addresses Yahtzee of Zero Punctuation fame. Oh yeah, oh, yeah that, was, that was good. I do, I do like Yahtzee's. Similar, I guess, to Yahtzee's. There's a, a real um, sarcasm that runs through some of the songs. That really made me laugh. You know, a great kind of witty, sarcastic humour. Isn't UFO, there's a line which is, it feels so good to be a white straight man. So that is in the Yahtzee song. She's talking about Yahtzee. Yeah, that was very funny. That was you know, one of those moments when you kind of Stop what you're doing and start laughing. Yeah, again, both British, because apparently all the good commentary on American culture comes from Britain. And American politics. Good old John Oliver. John Oliver, yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan. Yeah, she got out of it in 2010, I think. I think that was when the second album came out, and then she went off to focus on non-video game-related folk music. Yeah, obviously a few years before the grand high shitstorm of Gamergate commenced, which... 
She probably got out of the scene just in the, the right time to avoid being drawn into that. On the one hand, yeah, I think it would have been interesting to have her perspective around at that point. On the other hand, I imagine if she had still been active on the gamer journalism scene at that time, she would have had absolute buckets of shit thrown at her. So yeah, I don't envy her. You know, being in a position when you have to kind of make a comment on this and knowing that expressing your opinion is going to bring like just a storm of hatred down on you. Well, yeah, I mean, veering towards Tangentville at this point, but yeah, I know Yahtzee Zero Punctuation has mostly just avoided commenting on Gamergate, I think, based on the episodes of his I've watched since it happened. I think he's expressed mild annoyance with people who shout at women on Twitter and also mild annoyance with some of the liberals for being oversensitive, but basically he's just stayed vaguely neutral. Yeah, but, you know, I like my geeky music and, you know, I do enjoy my video games. So but this is different because, you know, I've listened to music about video games in the past, you know, like World Without Sky, things like that. But having a soft guitar, folky sort of take on uh, video game music was really good and something different and something new. So I did really enjoy that. Yeah, I, mean, I think I've listened to like snarky music about pop culture stuff before or snarky or gimmicky pop culture music and to be honest it annoys the shit out of me for the most part but there's something in, the, in this or the, the the sort of sincerity and the slightly more considered by nature of it that really speaks to me getting that sort of comedy music or sort of sarcastic music it's a it's a really difficult tone to get right which is one of the great things about rebecca mays is that she does get that tone right that's something i've enjoyed for a few years i'm glad you liked it you know aside from the video game stuff which i really enjoyed it is just just good you know folk music it's just good entertaining you know, relaxing music. Yep. Yeah, no, she is, as I say, still recording under the name Bo Huntress, making music about things other than video games, which is still incredibly technically good, even if not quite as much my sort of thing, because I think it's both not about video games, and she's sort of played up the sincerity and played down the vi humour, I think. And yeah, you can buy these albums from RebeccaMays.com if us talking about them has at all inspired you, because obviously she is an independent artist, so I'm sure would appreciate the sales if you've enjoyed this coverage. Or I think if you Google Rebecca Mays Muses, you can watch the original versions on The Escapist with her homemade videos, which are quite fun yeah that sounds, that sounds good i should check those out and obviously i'll try and remember to throw some links to that into the blurb on the website and so on that's maze m-a-y-e-s in case we didn't pronounce the e well enough Okay, so that was Rebecca Mays. Now, we actually met up socially last night, and Alastair did give me my next recommendation in a plastic bag, which I have very obediently not opened, because I'm a good person. Alastair, what is it? This time, in a reversal of fate, I'm going to recommend a comic to Nick. Ah, We we haven't done before. So, in the bag is Jerusalem Chronicles from the Holy City by Guy Delisle. So it is. My God, this is like one of those amazing unboxing videos on YouTube, only it's only audio and there's no box. Yeah. There you go, there's a, a large comic for you, a collection of comics. That is yeah. both large and a comic. Yeah, well, Guy Delisle, he's a writer and illustrator, so he both writes and draws the comics. Uh, his wife works for MSF, uh, Maison Sans Frontières, or Doctors of the Out Borders, and she gets sent all over the world, and he travels with her looking after their children. He writes a comic about everywhere they go and sort of their life, so that he's done a whole series of them. And this one is about them living in Jerusalem in the Palestinian part in the West Bank. And it's kind of just about, it's just about their life. It's about what Jerusalem's like as a city to live in. It's about what you know, Israel's like as a place to live. It's a really, really interesting comic. It's, it's, it's witty in places. It's you know, insightful in others. You, know, you learn a lot. So I hope you enjoy it. Okay, excellent. I do like comics. I will give that a read and get back to you. Cool. Well, next time we'll find out. Okay, and that's it for this half-birthday extravaganza. We've been Moderate Fancy Violence. If you want more from us, we do post on our Twitter at MFV Podcast about both updates on the podcast and occasionally our thoughts on news in our geekosphere. And there's also a Facebook page, which I think you can find at facebook.com slash moderate fantasy violence or I think if you just search our name it probably comes up and of course we are on iTunes and Stitcher and if you listen to us on either of those venues and fancy leaving a review about how amazing we obviously are then that would be much appreciated we can also be found on our website which is moderatefantasyviolence.com uh, up there you can listen to this episode our back catalogue of episodes our sort of outtakes and extended episodes excessive fantasy violence and there's some articles who have been written uh, most recently I've written an article about the Coen Brothers their back catalogue and kind of my experience of discovering the Coen Brothers for the first time in my late teens I've been Alistair Ball you can find my writing at redtrainblog.com you can also find me on Twitter at Alistair J.R. Ball 
Okay, and I've been Nick Bryan. You can find my website at nickbryan.com, which should soon have some updated news of my self-published crime books, as the fourth one is imminent, and I'm also on Twitter as at NickMB. Okay, and next time we will be doing the Suicide Squad movie, of course, major superhero film, why wouldn't we? And we'll be talking about the completion of season one of Preacher, and we will be, of course, talking about Jerusalem. And we're both at the Nine Worlds convention, which is over the weekend of August 13th and 14th in London so we will be talking about that there might be some live convention audio but no promises etc we'll try and also because we are away at that convention over the period when we would normally do a lot of the recording and editing of the podcast there is a factual chance that the next episode might be a few hours or even a day or so late we will keep you updated on the Twitter about that hopefully it won't be any worse than coming out on maybe Thursday lunchtime instead of Thursday morning but we'll see okay I think that's it thank you very much for listening see you soon Hi. Okay. We got it. Are we done? Okay. Yes. Come on. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just thanks and thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. No. No. No, boys. Thank you for coming on. It's been fun. And now. Yes. Just put in the thank you because I'm nice and polite. Into okay, it. I'll see how much editing I can do to make that sound natural. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> There's so much editing in this. <laughs>